Good morning, Broadway Christian Church. Thank you for joining us here this morning. Please take a moment to click the subscribe button and turn on notifications by hitting the bell. We loved seeing all of you interact with the service last week. We encourage you to continue that and comment with any prayer requests or praise. We love to connect with you. After the service, please visit our Facebook page to watch the Q&A session with our new student minister, Christopher Lawrence, and his wife, Abby. Get to know the newest members of the Broadway family. Now, let's worship together in one voice. Well, good morning, everybody. Wherever we're at this morning, I just wanna welcome you whether you're streaming at home, streaming on the road, we're very glad to have you. And so this morning, usually um, we, we start by just centering our hearts and our minds on God, and we take a few moments to be quiet. This morning, I wanna do something just a little bit different. I want you to ask yourself the question, why are you, why are you worshiping this morning? Because sometimes we have this tendency to, to section off worship as this one spot in a church service and leave it there. And that, the truth is, that's just not the, the correct way of looking at it. You see, whether we sing, that's worship. Whether we're listening to a message, that, that's listening to what God has for our lives, that's worship. Whether we're praying, that's worship. Whether we're giving, whatever it is, everything combines into worship. And so this morning, I just want to ask the simple question, why are you worshiping? Because it has everything to do with God, but it also has everything to do with us in the sense that worship is the simple way of putting all of our issues, all of our struggles, all of our doubts, worries, and problems straight at God. And it's taking a moment to clear our heads and say, God, you're greater than everything that we have. And you're greater than everything that's going on. And so as we center our hearts this morning, let's ask ourselves that question, why are we worshiping? And the answer to that is to literally center our minds so focused on God that nothing else matters and that the gates of hell literally cannot prevail in our heads this morning. So take a moment and we'll start worshiping again. Oh, 
pray as this time as as literally society has shut down. And one of the things that has been so good for me uh, is is using this time in such a way that it's just focusing on you as much as humanly possible. And I know we have so many, so many distractions that can take place. We can get on Netflix and, and binge watch a show for hours upon hours. But God, my prayer for us, wherever we're at, is that we would continue to use this time, that we would walk out of this this coronavirus era and say, I I use this time to get to know the Father, to get to know the Lord even better than I did before. God, you want to use us, you want to speak to us, you want to breathe life into us. May we have the boldness, God, to take you up on that offer and to accept that invitation. Lord, speak into us this morning what we're about to hear. Let it breathe life into our bones again. We love you. In your great, great name we pray. Amen. I have not lost my mind. I am wearing this mask because I want to tell you about a fundraiser we are doing. Our elders uh, got behind this idea. We as a church wanted to do something for the frontline medical workers and heroes during this virus. And so we found a company local that we do business with that was making these protective face shields. We took the idea to the elders who loved it so much, they said, go ahead and order them even before you've done the fundraiser. We want to get these to the people. So we got 1,050 of these face masks. We have delivered them. Uh, We still have some to deliver, but we have delivered them to UK Hospital, Central Baptist, uh, the VA, and uh, we just want you to see what you're a part of. These masks will be giving... Uh, an extra layer of protection to all of our medical workers. And so uh, I hope that you'll go online, you'll look at the link, you'll consider giving to help fund this project. One of our corporate partners of our church has already uh, made a donation. They were so excited by the idea. So I want to really encourage you to get behind this. The average mask is about $7.05. So uh, if you want to pay for 10 Go on and, uh, and do that right now. That would be awesome. But just know that you as a church are helping to contribute to the safety and care of our medical workers right here in Lexington. Now, I'm going to take it off to preach because it's, uh, it's a little unique to be inside that. So I have an extra care for the people wearing it. That's a difficult thing. So, uh, so I have even more appreciation for what they do. Um, if you are following along a new version, uh, which means if you go to the U version app, you look under events, then you look under Broadway Christian Church, you will find this message. I'm going to ask that if you are, don't pay attention to the U version during the sermon because I am putting all of the info in there and you could just get lost. 
So when it's done, it will be there. You'll have it all. And uh, I would encourage you to take a look at it. But I'm going to put all these comparisons in there so that you'll have it. I don't normally do that much stuff in there, but I'm, I'm laying it in there. All right, let's get started. We are in a series called Darkness to Light. And today we're covering the Emmaus Road. I'm totally pumped about this. And so I want to start with this picture of the garden tomb, which to you and I would really be a sign of light. But in our story today, this is the darkness. And so we're going to start with the darkness and move to the light. And for our, uh, for our first people in our story today, this tomb, they don't really get it yet. And they're distraught and they're sad. As a matter of fact, Luke tells us in chapter 24, it says that sadness was written across their faces. And so, uh, and this is what brought them sadness. They don't yet know for sure, is this resurrection story it or has someone stolen the body of Jesus? And what they're really confused about is, is he risen? Is he alive? And they think the dream is over. As a matter of fact, uh, if, you, uh, if you look at Luke chapter 24, verses 19 and 21, that says that they're on this road to Emmaus. And as they're making this walk, that uh, Jesus appears to them. And on this walk, he asks them, literally sees their countenance and the, how down they are. And he asks them, what, you know, what's up? And they are like, how do you mean what's up? You know, don't you know what's happened? And he says, what's happened? And so Luke tells us that, he, that here's, what ha- here's the, the discourse. They say, the things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said, he was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and the people. But our leaders, leading priests and other religious leaders, handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped, listen, you see their problem. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Now we have the beauty of hindsight. I can't help but read that and want to smile. Like they're talking to Jesus, but they don't recognize him at this point. They are talking to the risen Lord and they're depressed because they they had their hope in him and now they think it's dashed. They think it's been broken to pieces. You, so they're in the darkness here even after the resurrection. And uh, like I said, we get the joy and the fun of the, uh, of the hindsight. We know what happens. And so it, for us, it's not darkness. But to them, their idea of a Messiah was not the picture Jesus had painted. You see, this is why a lot of people missed it. They were looking for a Messiah who was under the, the, the prophecies of the Ben David Messiah, the one who would be the reigning king, which Jesus is. But they forgot about the Ben Joseph prophecies, the son of Joseph prophecies, that were about a, a suffering Messiah. And so that, that was always a confusing part for uh, many people in Israel. That's why even John's disciples have to ask. And so they were looking for this ruler, this leader, and instead it didn't happen, and now they're, they're hoping hopes are crushed and they're, they're traveling back home. And they're traveling with the risen Lord, who in some way, shape, or form has not made his appearance known to them at this point. And so he travels along with them. And I love what Luke says in verse 27. It says, then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, I got to tell you, this is where I get excited. The scripture doesn't say what was recorded, but I can only imagine. I imagine that Jesus went all the way back and he started with Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, in the beginning, Elohim created the earth. But in Hebrew, it actually says Elohim, Aleph and Tav, which is the equivalent of of saying Elohim, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, which ties in with what John will eventually write in Revelation chapter 1, verses 18, when Jesus says, I am the one who was alive and dead and alive forevermore, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Maybe he went to the beginning of creation where it says, and and God created light, but it's three days later before God creates the sun. What is the light? It is Jesus. He says in John, I am the light of the world. He is the light. Think about in the transfiguration when just his face 
begins to show the true glory of God, and it shines so bright that the disciples can't look upon it. You know, just yesterday I watched a video of British sailors who had been on the ships during the testing of atomic bombs, and they said when the flash went off and they had their hands over their eyes, they could see their bones and their veins. When they looked at the person in front of them, they didn't see clothes or flesh, they saw through them. For just a second, the light was so great, they saw like x-ray, and yet that is nothing compared to the light of the world. As a matter of fact, in Revelation, it tells us that the day will come when our new Jerusalem appears, that there'll be no more need for the sun or the moon because the light of God himself will humiliate the sun. Maybe Jesus took him to Genesis chapter 3 where it was prophesied that the seed of woman would crush the enemy. Maybe it was because the light of the world would destroy the shining one, the nakash, the enemy. Maybe he took him to Bible characters like Isaac. Isaac was this son with a prophesied miraculous birth who rides a donkey to a mountain with his father. He's old enough to resist his father, but he submits. And on that mountain, he carries his own wood up that mountain to be sacrificed by his father. And right before he sacrificed, God stops Abraham. And there in the thickets is a ram caught with his horns in the, the thorns, only to mimic that eventually a son with a prophesied birth and a miraculous birth would ride a donkey into Jerusalem old enough to resist, but, but instead submits, carries his own wood up the mountain, sacrificed by the father, wearing the thorns, which are a sign of the curse all the way back to that Genesis 3. Maybe he told them, you've heard of Moses. Moses was born under a wicked king, so was I. During Moses' day, the king tried to kill all the children, so with me. During Moses' day, he was protected by the actions of his parents, so was I. Maybe he said, remember, Moses came out of Egypt, so did I. Maybe he said, do you recall that Moses was rejected by his own? Moses had time in the wilderness. Moses took a Gentile bride. Now, they didn't know that yet, but it was coming. Moses was accepted by the Gentiles. The, the Gentiles have accepted Christ. Moses is coming back. Moses came back for his people. Jesus is coming back for his people. Moses leads to the promised land. Jesus leads to the promised land. Moses battled Pharaoh, who was a pre-type of the Antichrist, and he delivered plagues upon him. What does Revelation say? But that Jesus will destroy the Antichrist, and it tells us about the bowls and seals and trumpets. Maybe he took them to Joseph. Maybe he said, you remember Joseph? Joseph had a miracle birth. I had a miracle birth. Maybe you remember that Joseph was, was loved by the Father. I'm loved by the Father. Maybe he said, you remember that Joseph was sent by the Father, that his brothers rejected him, that he went to Egypt, that he began his ministry at 30, that he became a servant, that, he, that God loved him so much that he was able to save the people with bread, that I am the bread of life. Maybe you remember that he was sold by his brothers and I was sold by Judas. Maybe you remember that in prison he talked to two different prisoners and one went free and one died. Maybe you remember that on the cross I had two prisoners there and one died and one went into eternal salvation. Maybe he said, you remember that Joseph's garments were stripped off of him and he was the victim of false witnesses. Maybe you remember that his major theme was forgiveness. Maybe you remember that in the end, it says in Genesis 50, that when the brothers realize it's Joseph, they're distraught because they know they've done evil. And Joseph says to them, what was intended for evil, God has made for good. And you realize that he returns good for evil, just as I do. Maybe you remember that they didn't recognize Joseph, and they don't even recognize him. Maybe he brought up Jonah. Maybe he said, you remember Jonah. Jonah offered himself as a sacrifice. I've offered myself as a sacrifice. Jonah spent three days in the belly of the well, or the great fish, three days, three nights. I've spent three days, three nights in the grave. Maybe you remember that he was thrown into the sea as a symbol of the grave and also kind of a symbol of baptism. Maybe you remember that, uh, that the grave couldn't keep him. Maybe you remember that the people, everyone in that town was saved by his message. Maybe you remember that he's represented by Boaz as the kinsman redeemer. Maybe you remember that he's represented by the husband, Hosea, who marries an unfaithful wife. And every time she goes off in adultery, he brings her back and loves her. 
Maybe Jesus took the time to teach them that he was in the feast, all the feast of Israel. Maybe he told them, you've heard of the Passover. I am the Passover lamb. As a matter of fact, the, 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 I have been called by John the Baptist, the lamb of God. The, the, the very shepherds who certify the lambs for the temple came to me at my birth, woken by angels in the night, and saw me as the lamb of God. Maybe he said, you remember following Passover as first fruits. I'm the first fruits of resurrection. Maybe he said, next is Pentecost, and it's me who will put my spirit into you, as he had told the disciples. Maybe he mentioned to them the, the feast of, of Yom Kippur, where one is chosen to take the sin of all. Maybe he reminded them of the Feast of Tabernacle where the, the point is that God chooses to come and dwell among us and Jesus left the thrones of heaven to come and dwell among us. Maybe he went to the symbols of the, of the temple. Maybe he said, you remember there is a menorah in the temple. It's the light that always burns before God. And I am the light of the world and I always burn in the, and shine in the presence. Maybe you know that that light is lit by the olive oils and I am literally pressed in the garden to the point that my juice came out. In the garden where? Of the olives. Maybe he mentioned the Ark of the Covenant with the three items in it that we mentioned last week that's got the mercy seat on top of it where God's mercy is displayed. <coughs> Maybe he mentioned the, the things inside, the manna because he's the bread of life, the, the rod that budded because he brought new life from a dead cross. Maybe he mentioned the testimony because from here on in there is only one testimony. It's Jesus. Maybe he took them back to prophecy. Maybe he brought up Micah chapter 4 where it prophesied those shepherds. Maybe he brought up Micah chapter 5. I've got Micah chapter 5 for you, verses 2 and 3. But you, Bethlehem Ephraim, are only a small village among the people of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. The people of Israel will be abandoned by their enemies until the woman in labor gives birth. Maybe he took them to Zechariah, Zechariah 12, 10, where he said, where he prophesied this, I will pour out my spirit of grace and prayer on the family of David and the people of Jerusalem. And they will look upon me whom they have pierced and mourn for him as an only son. And they will grieve bitterly for him as for a firstborn son who has died. This is in their writings. Maybe he took them to Isaiah 53. This is the longest passage I think I've ever used in this room. Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 9. We're going to read it, and I'll tell you why we're going to read it. This is one of the most fundamental passages. If you watch a website, I love the website, One for Israel, and it's testimonies of people who live in Israel, Jewish people who have become uh, to come to the realization that Jesus is the Messiah. And this, Isaiah 53, 1 through 9, is one of the most powerful passages for that. And, uh, and so I want us to read it together. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrow, acquainted with the deepest of griefs. We turned our backs on him and we looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrow that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced. For our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have left God's paths to follow our own, and yet the Lord laid upon him the sins of all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before his shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. 
No one cared that he died without descendants. That his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. You all, this passage in Isaiah, a thousand years before Jesus, describes the event completely. Completely. Surely Jesus took them back and reminded them of the prophecies of himself. Maybe he took them all the way to Daniel and reminded them of the time frame so that they would know that the time frame of the Messiah was upon them. Even the Magi got it. They figured it out by Daniel's prophecies. Maybe Jesus reminded them, look, if the Magi can get it, surely you can get it. (coughs) Maybe he took them back to the, the meeting with Abraham. And in light of the covenant with Abraham to remind us of that which we talked about in here once before that in the covenant with Abraham when God comes to Abraham and and it's it's a it's a weighty thing they cut these animals in half and and the two parties walk through the blood trough together and the blood splashes on their sandals and their feet and on their garments and they're reminding each other that if either of us breaks our covenant may this horrible thing happen to us. And before God lets Abraham do that, he puts him off to the side and God passes through the blood by himself. And when he does that, what he is saying is, Abraham, if you break the covenant or I break the covenant, may the punishment only be upon me. And so he comes in flesh and he finishes the covenant started with Abraham. Literally from the cross, he says, it is finished. What is he saying? The body that I promised to to allow to be broken and pierced and destroyed for the breaking of the covenant is being broken for you. Any of you. That's why the Bible says we become sons of Abraham by faith. We are entering into the promise God made all the way back to Abraham when he said, I would take it on myself. Imagine the things that he's sharing with them and reminding them and drawing back to them all the time while they're walking. I, I mean, if you could pick out a moment in the scripture, where would you want to, to have a moment that you could pop into and glimpse? There's so many, but this would definitely be one of them. To walk the road and hear God himself describe how he has laid himself out in picture and picture and symbol and prophecy and verse after verse after verse from the beginning to the end. From literally the very first sentence of the book. And so Jesus gives them this This brilliant and beautiful discourse, this wonderful lesson as they travel along and they never recognize him. And he teaches and he talks and he brings all the symbols together. Can you imagine what's going through their heads and their heart? Can you imagine how they started in darkness with the idea that our our hopes for a Messiah were dashed? But the more we listen to this guy... This, this guy is explaining who the Messiah was. He tied in the suffering Messiah. He brings in the reigning Messiah. This guy is blowing our mind. Imagine, maybe we got it wrong. They get to their village, and it says that he acts like he's going to go on further, and they, they invite him to stay, and he comes into the house, and there in the house, they, uh, they, they're going to have a meal, and, and in the meal, it's, it says in, uh, in verse 30 that they sat down to look, to, to take bread. And it says that Jesus took the bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it and he gave it to them. And at that moment, I love it. At that moment, what did we celebrate last week when he took communion? We said it's about remembering him. It says that when he took that bread and he blessed it and he broke it, as soon as he broke it, suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. How interesting, how wonderful that it happened at the breaking of the bread. Now Luke 24, 32 tells us that, uh, that they're overwhelmed. They say to each other, Did not, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scripture to us? 
You see, the problem that many people have had is they, they are willing to accept Jesus as a good teacher. They're willing to look at him as, per, as potentially a prophet. Some of the world religions will even acknowledge him as a, world, uh, uh, as a prophet, but not as Messiah, not as divine, not as God incarnate. You see, I have to believe that Jesus really explained to them who he was. And their hearts burned within them. And my hope is that as you think of who Jesus is from the Old Testament, from the very first verse of the Old Testament, to who he is today, that your hearts burn within you. You see, John said that one would come greater than him, John the Baptist, who would baptize you with the Spirit and with fire. And I'll be honest with you, I'm praying that right now, not because of my words, but because of God, that your hearts would fill that fire, that it would burn within you, that you would desire the real God, not a good teacher, not some prophet, but the the living God. Look at Revelation chapter 1, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the Aleph and Tav, the one who from beginning, Colossians says, all things were created through him. John says in one, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, Jesus has explained to them, he's not some good teacher, he's not half the Messiahship, he's not a guy you could have put your hopes on, and it was, it's gone, he is God. And this picture of Messiah is much greater than something politically. It's beyond the idea of a guy who is the president or king or ruler of Israel. It's beyond that. It's into an eternal, permanent, once and for all sacrifice for sin. I think it's incredible that that realization pops into them at the breaking of the bread. So I want to know, do your hearts burn within you this morning? For a hope, a living hope, a resurrected Jesus, the one and only true and living, the God of all creation, the Messiah who has paid the permanent price for you so that there no longer be any need. I bet one of the things he told them about was that Yom Kippur, was that idea of a sin covering that was repeated year after year after year, but that now it would never need to be repeated. Because once and for all, it had been paid. And we want you to know, listen, if you need to make a decision to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we're still open for that business. We've found ways, listen, we, even if you're one of the people that's been wanting to be baptized, we, we found ways to make these things happen within the, the confines of our, uh, our current legal shutdown or whatever you call it. We'll make it happen. But you can today, right now, wherever you are, believe by faith. You see, Romans 3.22 says, by faith you are made right with God. But you're not made right with a good teacher. You're not made right with a prophet. You are made right with the true and living God who paid for your sins once and for all so that forever you could be His. Why? Because of the simplest verse everyone's ever memorized. Because God so loved the world. And to you who've already become a Christian, let me remind you, if He loved you when you were a sinner, He still loves you today. That doesn't, that don't let your mistakes or your, your mishaps weigh you down to the point that you, you feel you can't get back up. He loved you when you weren't even a believer. And if that was the case, He loves you today. I want you to know, I want your hearts to burn within you because the love of God desires you. All of this from this story from Genesis 1 to now was for you. So if you need to make a decision, please reach out to us. I think my cell phone number's on our slides. I know uh, my email's on our church website. We want to be a resource for you. Please reach out. Make that decision today. Believe in the true and living God. The, the, The one that the Bible says that Godhead dwells in bodily. God, we thank you 
We thank you for the beauty of who you are, for the, the wonder of this story of Emmaus, the amazement of how you have, you have woven all these stories, scriptures, prophecies, even, even specific words together for our sake because you love us infinitely. And Lord, we're praying for those today who hear this word that if just one person needed to hear it, that, that it connected. God, we thank you that you love us enough to write this whole story over thousands of years to establish truth and hope and an eternal life for us. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.
Every breath it is a gift Every moment is a treasure All my past and my regrets My present and my future And every table is a feast Every heartbeat is an altar
God, as we go out throughout this next week, Lord, if, if nothing changes, if everything changes, God, I pray that we would be people who run diligently without distraction, who run wholeheartedly with a passion for you like anything else, God. Lord, what you've done for us, the celebration that we got to partake in last week, and it just continues day after day after day. Lord, that lives in us. You live in us. And each day is a brand new start. It's a brand new call. It's a brand new opportunity. And so God, if we've gotten lost in the mundane, if we've gotten lost in, in the day after day kind of feel, Lord, spark us up. Show us something new, like we know you continue to do. That we may see you through the other side of whatever is standing in front of us. God, we love you. But even more importantly, you love us so much more. In your great name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, thanks again for tuning in with us this week. We hope to keep doing this, but we really hope to keep being here with you guys. We hope and we wait for the day that you guys get to be back in the room and we're all together. If you didn't know, um, there's a couple ways to give that we want to go ahead and say. Um, as we're here, um, in-person giving has been taken away, unfortunately, but if you want to give um, in any amount, we would love for you to do that in one of two ways. We've got either on our online page at broadwaychristian.com slash give, or if you want to put a check in the mail and send it to us, our address is right here on the screen. We love you guys. Have a great, great week, and we'll see you back here next week.